song this morning. In the dark tried to hide you, steal you away. Dead tried to keep you inside of the grave. The enemy fought you. He tried, but he lost. You cannot be stopped. You believe that this morning? Let's sing this again. When we cried for freedom, you tore down the walls. The weight of our burdens, you carried it all. Our fears and our failures hang dead on the cross. You cannot be stopped. Move around. Breaker of chains, Jesus has triumphed over the grave. Sing hallelujah, the battle is won. Nothing can stand against our God. Let's sing the third verse together. We stand on your victory, we shout out your praise. Miracle maker, you're mighty to save. Awesome in power, relentless in love. You cannot be stopped. Mover of mountains, breaker of chains. Jesus has triumphed over the grave. Sing hallelujah, battle is won, nothing can stand against our God. Move the mountains, breaker of chains, Jesus has triumphed over the grave. Sing hallelujah, battle is won, nothing can stand against our God. Help me sing this this morning. There's nothing that can stop our God. 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 There is nothing. There is nothing that cannot be stopped. There's nothing that can stop our God. There is nothing, mover of mountains, breaker of chains. Jesus has triumphed over the grave. Sing hallelujah, the battle is won. Nothing can stand against our God. Amen. Let's give the Lord a hand clap of praise this morning. You may be seated. It's like every time I get up here, I'm like, wow, it's going to be a good day. It's going to be a um, good chapel service, a special chapel service, and I realize that God does that over and over. Um, we have a baptism today. We get to worship. Um, yeah, so it's good. <laughs> All right, so just wanted to mention, I'm sure most of you all knew this and some of you were there, but we had our um, scrimmage yesterday, I think. Um, and so I'm just really excited that we're, we're kicking off some of our sports and Lord willing, we get to have those seasons and get to support our campus. So I'm proud of our football team and everybody else who's practicing hards in their various sports and getting ready for our, our um, different seasons. 
I um, want to mention, as I mentioned last week, um, just Sunday school is starting up soon. And I think something I forgot to say last week is even if you've taught Sunday school in the past, I still need you to go ahead and reapply. Um, so I think there's a few of you that I'm still waiting to see if, if you have your house parents email me um, and if you want an application. So if you're wanting to do that, have your house parents email me. And um, I need to have your applications back by this coming Sunday. So you have about a week longer um, to get your applications and to get them filled out and get them back to me. You're welcome to give those to your Ionan interns or ask them, hey, can you get me a, an application? That's fine, too. You can go through the interns. Um, same with Praise Band. Um, actually, just get, it, get with Chaplain Ray if you're wanting to do that. I'm not sure exactly where he is in that process, but um, he's working on trying to build his, his Praise Band. So get with Chaplain Ray if you're into music and you're interested in helping lead worship. We do have um, a few new friends, and we're just going to wait until next week when they're actually in the room with us, when they're out of quarantine, and then we're going to welcome those guys so we can, we can all be together and actually say hello to them and, and welcome them. So um, let's just bow our heads as we, we enter this service. Father, um, just, just thank you so much um, for who you are. Just thank you that you're so powerful and you're a healer and a, a miracle worker and you truly transform our lives, um, but also that you're just gentle and you're, you're present here um, with us right now, um, just as a friend, as a comforter, um, as a companion. So thank you for who you are. Thank you for each of the people in this room and just how um, each of them are created in your image and so precious and loved. Um, and pray that we can live in that reality this morning um, and, and be at peace and listen to what you might want to say to us today. I pray this all in your name. Amen. We have a new house parent couple with us this morning that I'd like to introduce to everybody. Maybe some of you or all of you have met them. Steve and Cindy Blanchard. They live at Henry Home. Here they are. Let's give them a hand, please. All right. Welcome, welcome. <laughs> I've been getting questions this week about ultra marathons, and I've never ran one. But I told you last week about a cousin of mine who's ran in two. So one of the questions I got this week is, how far did he run? And by the way, who's the nearest cross-country runner right here? Okay, you need to ask Coach Adelk if you can wear these, okay, in your first big race. Waraches, okay. <laughs> See what Coach Doak says. But my cousin Ben entered two ultra marathons, a uh, hundred miles, and he made it over the fifty-mile mark in both of them. One was in Leadville, Colorado. The other one was in Lake Tahoe. Now, after he passed the fifty-mile mark, I think he made it closer to sixty miles in one of them. He told me he said, "How when you start seeing stars in the middle of the day." Yeah, it's time to sit down. And, and so he did. But you remember me telling you last week about the Tarahumares, some people that live in the interior of Mexico in the state of Chihuahua. And they run ultra marathons and they win them. And, and they finish the 100 miles and, and, and they wear warachis. They don't wear specially designed running shoes that cost hundreds of dollars. Uh, they live in an area called the Copper Canyons, or Barranca del Cobre. It's six canyons that are interconnected. Five of the six are 1,400 feet deeper than the Grand Canyon. Collectively, the Copper Canyons are four times larger than the Grand Canyon. That's where they train, in the bottom of those canyons. And they have a relay race that they do. This is how they get so good at this. And it, they could be a little more creative on the name. They use a wooden ball. They use a wooden ball. And it's, they call it kick the ball and chase it. Now, some of you could be a lot more creative than that. You could give me a title for their relay race, right? But they literally kick a little wooden ball all through the day and all through the night. And when it goes into the cactus, when it goes off a ridge, they retrieve it. And, and they, they, keep, they keep going. They keep going. That's how they train. They build up an endurance and a stamina <clears throat> physically that most of us probably would never be able to, to get to. And they become a model for runners all over the world. But as I mentioned last week, um, 
We don't have any Tarahumaris in our midst this morning that I know of. Now, if we do, I want to meet you. Please stay afterwards. But we have a lot of ultra marathoners. And those of you that were here last week, we recognized every house parent and every youth worker in our midst. But there were some that weren't here last week that weren't on, but they're on today and they're here with us. So, so those of you that stood last week, I'm going to ask you in just a moment to stand again because they talked about ice cream being sold down at headquarters now, okay? So you're gonna get a double scoop. If you were here, if you were here last week as a house parent, a youth worker, I want you to stand as well, along with the others that are, that are here this morning. Please stand and let's all give them a huge round of applause. They've ran an ultra marathon and they've finished. Please stand, all of you. Thank you. Thank you. God bless you. God bless you. I, I, used, I used to think that Tara Humares were the ultimate ultramarathoners, but they're not. House parents and youth workers are. Self in the sight of the Lord. Humble thyself in the sight of the Lord. We come together here each Sunday morning in the name of Jesus Christ. We are a colorful group. We represent different ages, different interests, and different backgrounds. We represent different beliefs and different values. Some of them are pretty good, and some of them maybe aren't so good. One thing we know for sure, none of us here are perfect. Many of us here have come to believe that Jesus Christ is Son of God. We believe he died for our sins, was buried, after three days rose again from the dead. We believe he ascended into heaven and generously poured out his Holy Spirit to fill the hearts of his believers. We believe his Holy Spirit is a very powerful and mysterious reality. And we believe that he will return again one day to bring salvation to those of us who are eagerly waiting for him. We are told that Jesus came to set us free. Many of us here believe that. We believe he came to set us free from every addiction. We believe he came to set us free from harmful relationships. We believe he came to set us free from the travel of unforgiveness, the grudges we harbor towards others, and the self-hatred we have to have for ourselves. Probably not everyone here has believed this good news. Some resist, others are reluctant, but perhaps curious. And yet all of us here each week are learning to respect each other as we share our laughter and our lives together. For that, we are grateful. Let us pray. Our, our Father, Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Hey, good morning. Let's see. My, can you turn this thing off here? So we don't do like double whatever. Okay, thanks. Hey, I um, want to welcome everyone here this morning and uh, congratulations again on the football team for the work that's going on and the runners. I see the cross country runners are at it again. They've been running. So just an exciting time of the year. And like Angela said, I'm really grateful to God we're able to do these things right now. And uh, um, Eli, how's, how is virtual rodeo going? How great. Is, how, how close to being done are we right now? No idea. We're still virtualizing rodeo or whatever it is. <laughs> okay. Well, uh, good job on the virtual rodeo as it's happening. Um, you guys remember last week um, what faltering faith looks like? Okay. I'm, thank you for not insulting me and saying being a Chicago Bears fan. Um, what, do you, okay, you remember last week, faltering faith. Okay, uh, let me give you just a quick, um, quick history lesson here. Can you? Yeah, here we go. That's pretty much what it looks 
like right there. Yep. Story of Mike. Um, okay, you remember now what faltering faith looks like? Okay. Um, what did Peter do wrong in that moment? Does anyone remember? Yeah, he, okay, instead of keeping his eyes fixed on Jesus Christ, the author and perfecter of our faith, he looked at the what? The, the wind and the waves around him. And we do that all the time. And I, uh, I am, happen to be, uh, you're very fortunate this morning, actually. I'm an expert on faltering faith. Um, well, I practice it daily. Um, in fact, I had a, just yesterday, um, I'm, in, I'm in my backyard, and it all started actually Wednesday. I come in, I was going to mow my yard, and there's a, there's a cable laying, this mysterious black cord laying across the backyard, goes to the pole, and it's just looped around, and it goes around through the water on the sidewalk. It's in standing water, and I've followed around the house, and it goes into this thing, majiggy thing on the side of the house. So it didn't look good, all right? So I, I, and I was in a hurry, and I didn't know who to call, so I sent a, a triple email to three different people I thought might be interested in this mysterious black cord running from the house and looping around and across the sidewalk through the water. And, uh, and, tried, and whenever you do an email, if it's not a phone call or face-to-face, -face, you have to be real careful and make sure, it sound, make sure, make sure that sounds friendly and it, so I looked at that thing, okay, and, hey, guys, uh, how you doing? And anyone know about the, the black cord running around through my backyard? And, and uh, a little while, I get an email back, and, um, yeah, so-and-so subcontractor from so-and-so, and they're probably, it's, it's low voltage, um, just try not to trip over it, and they're going to come back out sometime to finish installing it. So this is a, I'm, I'm reading this email and I thought, this is nuts. Okay, one, I'm not an electrician, but dad taught us on the farm, okay, you don't leave a job unfinished. So, okay, I'm just like, this is just ridiculous. And then, okay, students, just humor us adults in the room for a minute, but how many of you in the room have been to a slips, trips, and falls training? How many have been to it like 10 times? I've been to 15 of them and watched Larry fall and then I've been to the lockout tag out and about like dangerous wires and, and uh, first aid, check the scene, scene is not safe. I have a cord running through water on my sidewalk and I'm told that what's well, low voltage, just try not to trip over it. And that was my email on Wednesday. And then now, like I say, I'm telling this story because it's a group from off ranch that's doing it. So I'm not calling out anybody on ranch on this, but here's what happened yesterday because that's still there right like that today okay and that was something that was done either Monday or Tuesday um, I spent 30 minutes in my backyard thinking about someone I've never met having thoughts I should never have all right that's what you call faltering faith okay we do it. We do it all the time. Uh, most of us have been following the Lord Jesus for a while. Um, how easy is that to happen? Okay, faltering faith. So here's a question I have for, for the group. All right, we know what faltering faith is. A lot of us have practiced it and practice it pretty often, more often than we'd like to admit. How about this? What does great faith look like? Okay, we have. You, you can follow me around and get a, take notes and, and learn what faltering faith looks like, but what does great faith look like? Hmm? Today, we're going to find out. Guys in the room that have girlfriends or have had girlfriends, I want to ask you what's worse. When your girlfriend gives you the silent treatment or when she insults you. Which one's worse? Silent treatment? Silent. How many think insult? How many think silent treatment? Okay, you know what? Girls, just for the record, you need to quit doing that, okay? It's not being kind. That's something Jesus would never do, okay? 
Got it? G- guys, are you good with that? Um, guess what? Jesus actually does both today. All right? He gives someone the silent treatment and then, then seems to call them a bad word. All right? So this is a story. Some of you have looked at this last week in your home devotionals. Um, this story, someone getting the silent treatment from Jesus and then seemed to be called a bad word, um, I just want to just pause right here for just a minute for those that are right now in this stage of life having trouble believing that, well, the, how do you know the Bible's true? People didn't just make it up. I want to say one thing about that right now, okay? This is a story, if somebody just made up the Bible, that you would leave out, all right? You, you would never leave this story in. It, it's, a, it's a story that creates a little bit of dissonance. When you come reading through the Bible and you get to this, it's like, whoa, okay? Um, what you're seeing here is this thing is old and authentic. Whether you believe it's really the Word of God yet or not in this stage of your life, that's going to be something to figure out. But you can't write it off as something that was just invented in more re- recent time. All right, here's an old story here. So let's take a look at it. Um, Chapter 15 of Matthew, verse 21. Jesus left Galilee and went north to the region of Tyre and Sidon. Uh, A Gentile woman who lived there came to him, pleading, Have mercy on me, O Lord, son of David, for my daughter is possessed by a demon that torments her severely. Something you need to know about this woman. Okay, we're in this region of What's the region? Do you remember the names again? Tyre and Sidon. This is quite a ways. This might be a a month journey from where Jesus and his group has been. It's quite a ways away. It's It's a foreign area. It's not where good Jewish boys are supposed to be hanging out. It's kind of a cosmopolitan city. Um, it's, it's a long ways away, and this woman, um, this translation says Gentile, the, it actually says Canaanite woman, is, and, which is a Gentile. But Matthew says this woman is a, is a Canaanite woman, and if you do just a little bit of history and read your Old Testament, you know that uh, that's probably not a good thing, okay? Canaanite woman would be, that means part of the people that are opposed to God's people. Canaanite woman, okay? And she says, Have mercy on me, O Lord, son of David, for my daughter's possessed by a demon that torments her severely. Um, what's, what she's saying here is um, she's not just tormented by a demon. The, this, this right here says she's cruelly tormented by a demon. Uh, there's an added word there for emphasis that whatever it is, and we don't know, but it must have been bad. She wasn't tormented by a demon. She was cruelly tormented by a demon. So this foreign woman from the region of Tyre and Sidon comes out and says, Have mercy on me, son of David. My daughter's possessed by a demon, torments her severely. Jesus, verse 23, gave her what? Yeah, Jesus gave her what? No reply. You got the silent treatment. Not, not even a word. What's up with that? Doesn't Jesus always, like, give a reply? Has anybody in this room ever gotten the silent treatment before? All right. There's, th- this is causing a scene. All right. Let's do something, Jesus. Okay. She's causing a scene. 24, Jesus said to the woman, okay, so now he talks to her. I was sent only to help God's lost sheep, the people of Israel. But she came and what? Worshipped him, pleading again, Lord, help me. If there's one thing that you could take away from chapel today, um, you could learn a really, really good prayer this morning. I mean, there's not a better prayer I could teach you than this. She she taught it to us this morning. What is it? Lord, help me. And that's exactly what she said. Lord, help me. (laughs) 
Jesus responded, it isn't right to take food from the children and throw it to the dogs. So now we go from the silent treatment to abusive language. I mean, that just does not sound like nice flanogram Jesus here, okay? He calls her a what? <clears throat> he refers to her as a dog. Um, probably my adult friends in the room, I'm sure you've heard this taught and preached on some a number of times, and there's a, there's a whole bunch of things you can do studying how he's using this and even how this exchange is happening. Whatever is happening here, it's real tempting to just try to tame this and dress it up. And, and uh, I'm going to say, I can't ever be just really good to be referred to as a dog. There's got to be some shock value to it, even then at that particular time. Now, was he winking and smiling at her when they're having this exchange, or did he look, look scolding and stern? I, I don't know, but I think it was a very loving exchange. But he does call her a dog. What's up with that? Let me, this is something that a lot of us might struggle with today because everything's breaking down from order to chaos. But such a thing as order Okay, and, and the Bible tells us as God's working to, to save the world, he does it through the Jews, the Jew first and also to the Greek. Um, when I was in kindergarten, Mrs. Gapinski had us line up for lunch break, alphabetically. All right, Dorian Abels was the front of the line every time. Mike Wilhelm was at the very back of the line, which if that wasn't bad enough, I had to stand by Wayne Vock. Okay, and that's how we did it every time. Now, there was order to that. But it didn't mean that Doreen was more valuable than me or Wayne Vock. It's just simply a matter of order. It would be like this. Um, we have a wedding ceremony, and um, there's an order to how that happens, right? You have, oh, maybe the flower girl comes and throws little petals down, and then the grandparents are seated, and then bridesmaids and groomsmen come in. The groom's, the groom's already out here, and then, then next comes the the what the, the maid of honor and the the best man and they come and then finally who comes last yeah bride who's bringing her down the aisle usually and her dad that's just how how we do it okay there there's an order to that and it's meaningful and beautiful um jesus is appealing to hey there's an order to how god's doing things here right it's not that I think that you're a nasty dog and don't want to help you. There's an order, and he's bringing that out. Now, watch what happens. She says, that's true, Lord, but even dogs are allowed to eat the scraps that fall beneath their master's table. Now, you see what she didn't do? She didn't argue with him, and she didn't call the campus police and report him for using a trigger word, all right? I mean, she doubles down. Okay, I'm invited to this. T I, you're the master of my table. She calls him master. It's all about him. And she's so humble. There's no, there's no ego to be offended. It's like, ah, whatever. I'm just, I'm here at your table. Dear woman, Jesus said, <clears throat> your faith is great. Your request is granted. Her daughter was instantly healed. It, let me just, three things I want you to see about this. All right. Th um, and um, there's a lot we can learn from this. Let's just, let me just cover three things. One, about great faith. Great faith um, comes to Jesus. Um, somebody might be in this room right now. I'm really disappointed thinking, well, good that is the dumbest, simplest thing I ever heard of. I want to hear about the seventh bowl in Revelation this morning. Well, not so fast. How are you doing with that? Really? <clears throat> Great faith comes to Jesus. Does your worry life outweigh your prayer life? Is your heart set on... Jesus Christ, or is your heart set on family, career, public opinion, wealth, romantic interest, self-importance? Yeah, I mean, really, 
Where, where are you in this? Okay, check yourself. Great faith comes to Jesus. And, and something about this, great faith is not about how strenuously we, like, act on it. Maybe, like, um, um, oh, like, right now I want to show Boys Ranch Chapel that God's real, so... I'm going to have God turn me into a purple dinosaur right before everybody right now, and I'm just going to believe it so hard it's going to happen. Okay, that, that's n really not what great faith is about. Um, it's not about how strenuously we act when we want something. It's about how consistently we acknowledge that we need Jesus Christ. So it's just how we, how we roll in life. And it's just saying, God, help me. God, thank you. God, help me. God, thank you. And then when that big whopping thing happens, we have exercised this faith muscle to where we can step into that big whopping thing in faith and know that it's of God. Okay? So um, great faith comes to Jesus. Um, isn't that just crazy to say that probably most Christians struggle with this very, very simple first thing? Second thing I want you to see about this uh, from, from our woman here is great faith recognizes his authority. Great faith recognizes his authority. That, that word authority is a word that I'm going to venture to say most of you in this room don't like. I mean, it's a word that's not very popular in our culture today. And probably right on Boys Ranch, you hate that word authority. Um, but watch what she does. This, this woman comes out and she calls him son of David. She refers to him not once, not twice, but three times as Lord, recognizing his authority. So when he's having this exchange with her, okay, it's all about him being king. Okay, there's a, real, there's a movement in Christianity right now in America that will try to make the church into sort of a, I don't know what you call it, kind of a pop psychology club with Jesus as the uh, kind of like life coach mascot or something like that. Okay, don't get me wrong. Jesus is, is gentle, but he's a king. I mean, he's a king. He's a ruler over everything. And this authority, where it's properly placed and acknowledged, it, it's a good thing. Okay, if um, Jr. was on a plane, okay, and that pilot um, drops dead of a heart attack, okay, it happens all the time, right, Jr.? It's never happened, thank goodness. Okay, but the pilot drops dead of a heart attack, okay, Jr. doesn't want to be in the cockpit right now, okay? Who's he want in the cockpit? Somebody who knows how to fly. He wants a pilot in the cockpit when. When we're living life, and life is hard, okay? When you're living life, all right, who better to have in control of your life than the one who, where authority belongs? And if he created you with your best in mind, okay, there's nothing more that you, than we would want than the, to acknowledge his authority. Um, there's a... Um, there might be some in the room, and this is really, really popular thought nowadays. There's a questioning of the Christian faith based on, well, yeah, 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 there's lots of religions. Okay, yeah, well, there's Christian religion and lots of other religions. And that's true. And not only is that true, there are some religions that are good religions. What I mean is there's, there's wisdom and there's good teaching within those systems. There's some that are absolutely nutso and crazy and harmful to people, but there's some that are you know, philosophical systems that might be pretty good. But watch this lady. If you're going to learn something this morning from her, she's in Tyre and Sidon. Okay, these are cosmopolitan centers that had no shortage of religion, of other gods, of philosophical systems, and, and very sophisticated and yet she turns her back on that and comes out to meet a carpenter peasant with a band of ragtag followers from out of town on her knees and calls him son of David, which means God's Messiah. Great faith recognizes Jesus' authority. 
once you recognize his authority, it becomes easy and even necessary to, to accept it in our lives. It's a good thing. Um, the third thing, last thing I'll mention is great faith is, um, accepts its place. And this is something that, that's becoming increasingly difficult in our culture today, okay, is accepting our place because we're living in a culture that's so much about, and if, it, man, if, it doesn't matter if you wear a, a red hat or have a blue bumper sticker, you're living in this world where everybody's fussing about rights and entitlements. <sighs> she does none of that. Rather than focusing on her particular place at the table, this whole thing about Jew and Gentile doesn't throw her off one bit. She is dialed in on the Savior of the world. When you get that, this great faith, when you get that, that it's not about what we're entitled to in our rights, okay? It's just this, I am so grateful to be invited to the master's table. It doesn't matter if I'm driving a tractor or if I'm a chaplain at Boys Ranch or if I'm washing dishes at uh, Kentucky Fried Chicken. Um, whatever it is, wherever God has me, it's okay because I'm a kid at the master's table. Uh, so great faith accepts its place. So what you'll do is, with this great faith is that it's going to stir in you gratitude. So the boredom, the frustration, the discontent that, that eats your lunch, that will start to dissolve whenever you have this great faith that accepts your place at the master's table. It's like, I'm a child of the king. I cannot believe that. And suddenly, other believers in Jesus Christ, no matter how much we see things differently or whatever our backgrounds, that's it, like, that's a brother, that's a sister. And People who don't believe in Jesus Christ, that is someone created in God's image. God has something special in mind for that person. God died on a cross for that person. And everything around you just starts to change when you have this great faith. When you come to Jesus, when you recognize his authority, and you accept your place. So this um, just... To wrap this up, um, there's some in this room right now that might have felt alone and maybe feel very alone. Does my life matter? Maybe I'm faking it and I surround myself with a lot of activity, a lot of people, a peer group or something, and I fake it. But really, I feel so alone. It's like I'm screaming without vocal cords, okay? No one notices, but I feel so alone and abandoned. Um, there was a girl when I was growing up, I w went to this little, little farm community, country to school. We had, um, we had 12 girls in my class and eight boys from K through 12. And so if somebody new moved to town, it was a big deal. You're kind of getting an eyeful of the new person. We had a girl move to town when I was, oh, maybe fourth grade. And she, she stood out. Um, this girl, um, one, she was, she was bigger and already starting to mature. And that was because she had missed so much school, I guess, that she actually was a couple years older than the rest of us. And she always looked really scared and really sad. She was always kind of dirty. Her clothes didn't fit. They didn't match. And she wore the same ones maybe consecutive days. And the one thing that was really noticeable is like, we're a bunch of dumb old rotten kids, but I noticed her hair wasn't right. And what it was, her hair was matted, okay, which meant there was nobody taking care of her. Is it, you know what I mean? Her hair hadn't been brushed or combed out, and this girl never knew how to do that. And that's, so she came to school. And, and you would think that maybe kids would have enough goodness in their hearts to to look out for someone like that because you could tell no one at home was looking out for her and uh, we called her instead we what we did is we called her awful names and we called her 10 ton tessie just because she was bit bigger than us more mature and she just would fight back tears all day and try to find a place where nobody else was okay she was just trying to always get away from people we had, um, that year we had a, um, 
a gift exchange at school at Christmas, which is a really dumb idea for some a, a few reasons. Okay, but because poor kid, kid like uh, th this girl um, had no one helping her with her gift. Okay, so we have we exchange names and we bring our gifts to school, and uh, under this tree where we all have our little gifts, there's you, it stands out like a sore thumb. There's one blob of stuff under there. It's tissue paper with scotch tape kind of all kind of wrapped around it, okay? And, and you could tell that you knew it was hers, and she tried to put something under that tree for the person that she drew. Make matters worse, she happened to draw my friend who was real, at that time, he's a real good guy today, but he went through, a, he was a real mean kid there for a while at school. And uh, that's whose name she drew. So when we get our gifts, he gets the little wad of Kleenex with the tape. And uh, I open my gift up, and I can remember it was an orange Tonka dune buggy. And the older guys in the room, my brother Griffin knows what Tonka is. Um, my, my friend opens up his little wad of Kleenex there, and he's making the biggest deal about it already because he, was, he thought it was so bad that he got a gift wrapped like that. And here is this little plastic car that's like the things that back in that day you would have bought at the, at the, the dime store right at the checkout by the chapstick. And uh, is that soft, cheap plastic. And a dog had chewed the one wheel off on the, the little car. And my friend <clears throat> um, takes that opportunity to make the biggest scene about that and embarrass this poor girl. And he takes that car up to the teacher, and that teacher looks at it, and you would think, ah, oh, finally, somebody's got this girl's back, right? And then I kid you not, that teacher looked at that car, and she just sneered and shook her head with disgust. And she laughed about that car with, with my friend. That girl had nobody. And I'm it's sad to say that I've met a lot of people in my life that have felt that way. And even right now, with all the support in this room, you, you might feel that way or feel that way sometimes. All I want to say is if there's anything you can learn from this Canaanite woman is that God has called us to a place where we belong. You can bank on that. So all the the temporary setbacks or the temporary distractions, that's just all they are. They're temporary. He has a plan for each one of us in this room, a place where we belong. You can believe that. Amen. And I need you to soften my heart. Break me apart, I need you To open my eyes To see that you're shaping my life and all I am And I surrender Give me faith Trust what you say that you're good. Love is great. I'm broken inside. I give you my life. I need you. Soften my heart and break me apart. I need you to pierce through the dark and cleanse every part of me. And all I am, and I serve. Trust what you say.
say that you're good is great. I'm broken inside. I give you my life. I may be weak, but your spirit's strong in me. My flesh may fail, my God, you never will. I may be weak, but your spirit's strong in me. My flesh may fail, my God, you never will. Give me faith to trust what you say, that you're good. I'm broken inside I give you my life Verse 1 one more time And I need you To soften my heart To break me apart I need you Open my eyes to see that you shape in my
Jesus, precious Jesus, oh, for grace to trust Him more. Uh, as we prepare to close out our service, we're going to celebrate a baptism this morning. So Kirsten and Mr. Akers, and y'all come down this way. Baptism's pretty special. It's a outward expression of an inward feeling. And when we accept Christ, that inward feeling needs to be seen by others. But it's kind of funny. Great faith was the message this morning. And my morning devo is something I want to read to you guys. And it comes from Matthew 18. And it says, at that time, the disciples came to Jesus and asked, Who then is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven? And he called a little child to him and placed the child among them. And he said, truly, I tell you, unless you change and become like this little child, you'll never enter the kingdom of heaven. So if you think great faith has to, faith has to come from a big guy, a big gal, a big person, a grown up, a little child has great faith. And faith is accepting Christ because when this kiddo moved into my house. Hmm. You guys have no idea, each of you, how special you are to the house parents. You guys. And if you've never heard this, you're why I'm here. You're why we're here. This is a special day. And I'm glad you let me be a part of it. Mr. Akers, would you lead us in a prayer? Yeah. Father, I thank you for the opportunity for Kirsten to be in your presence and make this step of faith for you, Father. Father, I just ask from this moment, and I know you've been there from before, but you take this life and you make it precious and special to the people that she comes in contact with, just like she's done for us. Father, Surround her, keep her, yes. and make her yours, like I know you will. Yes. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. amen. Kirsten, you believe Jesus Christ is the Son of God? Amen. Okay. Come to Jesus, acknowledge his authority, and accept our place. What a great way to show that, how that starts right here. So how, can you hop in there? I'm going to help you. Okay. Kirsten, by the authority of Jesus Christ, I baptize you in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. (laughs) Amen. There you go. All right, before we make our mass exodus, um, I'm going to close you guys in prayer. Just remember, just take it easy. Don't go too crazy when you leave the the chapel this morning. Um, Please bow with me. Dear God, I want to thank you so much for this message that we received this morning. God, my prayer is that, just like the Canaanite woman, God, that we continuously pursue you, and in doing so, not ever allow our faith to falter, Lord, but to have great faith in you, trusting and believing that you got us at all times. 
God, just pray for safety, and I pray for good health as we go out into our week. Um, Lord, and all these things I pray. Amen. Thank you.